my background is in making musical score, like using all the resources of computer science to, to make documents for you guys to, to play. I loathe <laughs> working in an electroacoustic environment and doing all that sort of stuff. And the last thing on the planet that I want to do is to be responsible for running a computer music lab. Um, but um, yes, I do spend a lot of time watching what those guys do and, and know a thing or two. Look, I mean, it's, you, you know how this is going to work, right? Like things will be more or less doable and people watching performances like this will think that it's, it's, it's still going to look impressive and they're going to think it's amazing and how did this happen? It's still going to look like sorcery and it's still not going to be real performance. Right? Mm -hmm. You're going to miss all of the intangibles that make conducting a thing, make chamber music intimate and allow for you know, to, to push and to pull back on, on Tempe. Yeah. But you know, performances can still go, and people will still look and be impressed. If we have this, if we have a happy hour, what is today? The twenty fourth of June, is that right? Okay. If we have a happy hour on the twenty fourth of October, that many weeks in, what do you think the the conclusion is going to be? You know, you go to concerts all over the place, and and you know, money comes and money goes. I'm like like answering commissions and moving across jobs and stuff. But when I've had the money, like I'm kind of like on planes a lot, like seeing if I can go see an interesting show somewhere, and the and that's like how to stay abreast of interesting shit, right? And not just think that whatever institution I wind up at, like, look, every, every place does a good job of trying to curate concert series and maybe has a good ensemble in residence. Even at the best places, you need to get the fuck out, right? And okay, so, so doing that the last 10 or 15 years has shown me that of the strands of new music that I like and respect the most, a lot of which are still centered in Europe, that the biggest critique that I'm walking around with at the moment that I'm listening to the music in the concert, right, my biggest critique is that there has been a, a, a flattening or attenuation or a compression, call it whatever you want, but paying attention to time flow. As timbral research has gone further and further and further in kind of like a post lachemann sort of way in, in Germany, they really are like pushing, like that's one, that, the area that's yielding the biggest sort of results because we're still finding more and more ways of like playing the instruments and people are finding ways to thoroughly integrate that into their personal technique and in, as performers and then into their pieces as composers, right? And it's no longer the sense of like a bag of extended techniques that's sort of like, you know, something that means extra shit from conservative American perspective, right? Okay. So as that process goes forward successfully, I have noticed that there has been a corresponding and hard to explain sort of thing where the time experience of listening to the music is like at the, the checkout thing at the supermarket when you put all the items down on that and the conveyor belt is just moving at a constant speed all the way through, no matter what the items are. And here the, the metaphor of the items is like the local phrasing and the figures and the gestures, right? The kind of musical objects that are being offered up by the pieces. Like here's a, you know, here's a Snickers bar and here's a box, here's a cool thing, here's a head of cabbage and here we have a thing of bananas. And it's like the thing in here, it's very sparsely populated and here's a shit ton of produce that all goes through at one time. <laughs> the things that are being submitted to the field of consciousness are changing, but the rate at which they're moving through, even if, the, if they're of different sizes and densities, is not being manipulated. A lot of what I've been doing for the last 10 years has been ferociously amping up the degree to which time is, is, is functioning in very, very huge overt ways as the music is moving around. And yeah, so there, there are specifics, right? There are all these like musical specifics that I could point to in, in the pieces, but it's, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't need to be fancy. Like a lot of what you'll see if you look through my scores and harmony is, is an example is there's a very, extreme palette of tempi that are that are taken. Harmony has just five tempi and only those five tempi and they're arranged by uh, metric modulation pivots that allow all of them to be materials in any one of those tempi to be rewritten um, without too much difficulty in any of the other four and so it creates this you know kind of pentagramic looking looking thing that I can move the material through which allows for um, something very concrete. This is not this is not some sort of like post serial sort of manipulation. You know, number sorcery on its own. Although I'm in favor of number sorcery on its own, I think it's great. It's really good that we belong to an artistic tradition that allows for that. But in this case, that allows for the picking of five different points of view to tell a story from. So that as I'm moving the music forward, I can flash back very obviously to something that happened before, and not just to one type of thing that happened before, like getting to the end of the Prokofiev Ninth Piano Sonata, and you realize, you get a little flash forward of what's gonna happen in the next movement, and change each of the four movements that way, right? Which is when I played that as a, a young and bad pianist. That, <laughs> I mean, just 
just not at all good. But, you know, I was going through all of that sort of stuff to find out, like, well, what did these people see? What did they see? And I was looking for what formally they, they saw as they built up these big forums. I'm like, when Prokofiev found a way to, like, to sort of flash the future to you, right, in the dying moments of the final tempo of these movements, like, what a fucking genius thing to do. And it was, it was very clear that that was genius and effective independent of the materials that would be specific to say Prokofiev for the needing to have sevenths or ninths in there to make a point at the end of the movement. Like, okay, so I'm not going to do that. Most people are not going to do that. But the way of flashing the future forward and the dying embers of the last tempo that's available, it's like this is a universally usable idea that can be ported forward into the contemporary music context too. And it's, I've been thinking about that, you know, since I was a teenager, I was, was playing through that music. And now I'm in a position to, to be able to do something about it as I've got better control over some of the materials of this type of music. And so those, those tempi are, I'm setting them up to point to each other so that I can flash back, sometimes not even once, but two or three times in a row before coming back to the kind of musical present of the, of the piece. And that happens so many times, 121 times. There's a flash forward or a flashback in that piece. It very carefully like worked out and calculated that in fact the entire material of the piece then becomes this experience of these integrated flash forwards and flashbacks. Mm. And that's only possible to get across because the tempi are so different. They're quite slow, quite fast, and quite instantly identifiable. Right? So it's a way of, of using something that, that could seem too simple, too bulk, too easy to identify just these five things but interweaving them to such an extent that the whole thing just becomes this, this, this flux of its complexity that's because of the time manipulation. Mm. Just time. And the last thing to note about harmony, different than most of the things that I've put out the last couple of years, is there's not a single Acello Rondo or Ritardando in that score. And yet it still meets my standards of, of this critique that I have versus European music of actually fucking with time as it goes along. And it's not, which, which I usually accomplish, I should say, by like some very dramatic Acello Rondi and Richard Rondi. Like I'm just a big, big believer. I think those went out of style because the 19th century, because Romanticism, which is of course the great enemy of modernist and postmodernist approaches to music, right? Because it's just saturated in, in, in Wagner and nationalism and eventually Holocaust and for good reason. It did to death between Wagner and Liszt the idea of Acello Rondi and Richard Rondi. They're just like vibrato. There are just so many bad, acritical, unreflexive ways of doing that, that people understandably for a hundred years just said, fuck it, and walked away. But it turns out, of course, that you can recoup those things. And so I've been exercising, grinding that blade in my music for the last 10 or 15 years and showing that you can reinsert these Acellarandi and Ritardandi that are very big, very dramatic, require a lot of planning from the players to figure out what the fuck that is going to mean. And now it's not, it's not difficult to play the way that like, working out true polyrhythms in the, in the separate hands of the piano are difficult to play. It's not graph paper work, but it's, it's deeply conceptual ensemble work where it's like you have to sit down and make these very conscious decisions about this, this musical thing that's being asked for that's not in other scores. And so you, you better get the convention right and it better be convincing even though it's guaranteed that you've never seen it before. In harmony, I was interested in getting that same degree of time complexity, but just by these constant sort of jump cuts between these five well-identified tempo areas. Like I'm interested in activating the fuck out of the, the way the time flow is working. And what I have found is that, to put it in the negative, like when I, what if I, if I have composition students and we're in private, um, no, you're not going to get a big increase in effect from moving from quarter equals 41 to quarter equals 43. Like that, that is not doing what you think it's doing. Like you're going to have to do more work like that. I know what you think that's going to do and it's not going to do it. They don't work like the ratio differences in polyrhythms, which is tends to be what younger, smart driven composers are assuming those will work like, and they're not the same thing. All of the dials that the notational system gives us for working with time work differently from one another, even though they're all uh, conceived of in terms of fractions. And, and then, uh, yeah. Those have to be worked out very, very radically differently. This discussion of time is, is so fascinating. You know, just from my point of view, being a percussionist, I mean, dealing with time and rhythm is kind of the name of the game. But I mean, I'm also just thinking like one of the things that I've spoken with many people about just in the current state of the world with COVID is that, you know, we perceive time so differently now at the beginning of quarantine versus now versus, you know, before quarantine and, and all of these things, it just feels so different because everything has been completely upended in our world. And do you just think that, you know, composers now, if they're 
being if they're getting some some pieces done during this time will they keep more of a keen eye towards that going forward it's possible and i mean i like the way like the framing of the entryway of the thought and the question is is a smart one because you know there's this you know our our non-musician friends have have all called us up or when we're on these these phone calls with our our friends and parents and stuff and be like well do you think this is impacting your art in a certain way and it's like are you going to write a covid piece it would it would do people well actually to to look at when the 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 coupling of the the moment that we the historical moment that we find ourselves in and the art that we are producing or, or performing or commissioning or whatever when there's an affirming useful productive coupling of the historical moment to the work and when that should really be resisted i think people will do very very well to to think through very carefully what will be right to couple and this is why is why i said alex like you're the thinking that gets you into the framing of the question is actually super smart compared to the way that most people, I hear most people asking the question because time, if anything, might be, and I don't know the answer, we don't know, nobody knows the answer to this, but, but if there is going to be something that is, has the possibility, holds out the possibility of being abstract enough that it could answer to the impossible size of this moment, and maybe there is nothing, like quite likely, I think the first answer is no, nothing. But if there is going to be something in the art making and music making that can answer to the exigencies of this moment, something like the shape of the shell of time in our art might be what it is. But of course, I don't know the answer. I mean, I think that you're wise to ask the question and know that you're wise to ask it from that perspective, but who the fuck knows? And I also think that the the historical ledger, just like, you know, classical music, you know, the stuff that all enticed us into being with these fancy musicians in the first place, like I think looking at classical and romantic and Baroque music tells us tells us a lot like it's it's usually not the case that beethoven was answering to you know scratching out napoleon's name on the front page of the, the third symphony that's usually not what's going on even if introductory like radio program lectures about classical music like to focus on those because because they tie into some historical event that's relatively well known it's usually the case that Beethoven was interested in working out his relationship to, to what might best be understood as ornamentation and seeing if he can elevate ornamentation to be something that was unlike anybody else, except maybe Schubert also saw that and would have gotten to it if he just hadn't died. So died so young, you know, and he's in this like ferocious weather system, like amount of energy of a relationship with his own, in his own relationship to in, ornamentation inside of instrumental music. And that then, okay, as time goes by and history happens and good things and bad things and people come and go. And we look back at that and we read into this kind of imminent musical argument that he's having very much with himself and also with his publishers and also the people around him, also the people, quartets that were playing and stuff. And, and, and we read that as the quintessential political and social resistance and insistence on a universal brotherhood and an egalitarianism that we rep- represent now with the Ode to Joy. But that's all retros- retrospective, right? And it's our right to do that. It's our right as human beings that come later to, to pin the artworks that stood up and that said something to the things that we understood that that historical moment is coming to mean. Do you, you understand what I'm saying at this point? Like, they're usually not artists standing up and saying, I'm going to write about this moment and try to, what is that actually? What, what terribly arrogant sort of maneuver on the part of an artist is that to stand up and say, no, no, wait, wait, listen. Here's what it is. Here's the piece that captures what it means to all of them quarantined inside. Like, is that really? Maybe instead, you should just focus on just really intensely doing your thing, exponentiating out your musical language, your musical practice, your network of collaborators, and then that's for later generations of people to come back and listen to the music that was produced in 2019, 2020, 2021, 2022, and make the determinations as they are always made post hoc to the production of history and see which of those things, if any of them, seem somehow later to be emblematic of the crazy shit show that in history that this moment definitely is. I I really, you know, I I don't, I'm not an arbiter of history any more than anybody else is, but I do think that there's a a lot, and of course I feel this way, right? Because I'm, I'm an instrumental, I'm a composer of instrumental music. It was like, it took, it took an enormous amount to get me to, to work with text and harmony. And I'm incredibly glad that, that the commission was staged that way. And there's some of my closest collaborators in the whole world that got me to do it. And I think it did really give me the benefit of being able to communicate the craziness of my music more easily to a larger audience of people because there's, there's text in it. But I have resisted text and staging and other representational contact, content in my music my entire life. And, and that is tied up with a sort of perspective that I'm 
I'm, I'm voicing right now, which is I think that we are supposed to have a musically imminent relationship with music itself, with performance itself, with time itself, with colors themselves. And that if we are lucky enough to actually squeeze something essential or vibrant or intense from that, then later other, other people will decide that that was somehow in a way that we didn't understand emblematic of the moment that we were. I also think percussionists are in a particularly good position to answer some of these questions. I, 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 percussionists are one of the things that the US does very well. <laughs> and I have had it suggested to me that the whole marching band culture in this country is crazy and, and definitely you know, from a militaristic core that that comes from, that it's one of the really good things that has given rise from 2000 forward to younger ensembles with these people who can actually count all the fucking rhythms. It, it, it is not unhelped by the number of percussionists who I guess were drill sergeants or drum majors or whatever the, the term is in high school who then think, fuck it, I'd like to do this at a real level. And then go into conservatory and figure all this stuff out because it is, it is unbelievable the degree of rhythmic accuracy that has become available in the last 20 years in the younger ensembles. It is qualitatively different than what it was even in 1999. And I do think that that's because we just like it started with the percussionists and it then spread. And you can now just demand from 19 year old players that they play this rhythm that was perceived as wholly impossible before. And they just get it absolutely right. And it's no longer considered to be this crazy ask to ask a musician to go in and get out the graph paper and the calculator and to just start at the slowest possible tempo and ratchet it up until it's completely correct and then play it as a musical gesture that can be time scaled and made sensitive in the middle of an ensemble piece with six other players. And yeah, so I mean, the, the sensitivity to the local details of time and the ability to plug that in exactly to Tempe correctly, like it's new and it's largely new with you guys. Like it came from the younger kids and, and then it just became like this cultural feature of new music in, in the US and, and also in Europe. And, I think it was led by the presence of like some incredible, incredible percussionists in the US. In Europe, I saw it more often being led by string players. Um, and now it seems to be equalizing out and you can just have the expectation of ensembles no matter what, which is fucking awesome for composers. And Ferdia actually is a good example of, 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 of this because the tupleting that's everywhere that's like this, you know, arguably a fetish, right? It's like, it doesn't need to be there all the time. And so the question is like, why is it always there? Which I think is, is a really good like, like, career-wide critique of, of, of his music, which is, which is brilliant and interesting. You will notice that it is very rarely the case that he's just tupleting stuff and not also then asking for some sort of time manipulation to happen even on top of that. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because, I, I don't think that that's because he just wants yet more, more ink on the page. Um, I think it's because he realized that it's not just the micro details of the timing, in, in rhythm, that it has to be suggesting that time is moving to or from something, the same way that harmony used to be suggesting that. Mm. And I think he perceived that from the very beginning. I think that a lot of the kind of his rhythmic followers that came from the, the 1990s forward have had to come to that from another, another. yeah, I don't think they, I, I think they lost that. I think everybody got hypnotized by the, by the local polyrhythms and missed that those are supposed to be mastered correctly and then furthermore plugged into musical trajectories beyond that. Mm -hmm. On that note, there's an amazing moment at the end of Harmony that actually was the first thing when we were talking about your music that was brought up was A major. Um, I mean, the piece arguably is in A major, which was not, a, not something that I was thinking about. But like, if you score four minutes of an A major spectral chord at the end, I mean, that's kind of a good case that maybe the piece was, I mean, isn't that how we decide the key the pieces are in in the classical mm -hmm. period? It's like it ends. But tell me, tell me about the conscious decision to include that. Well, I mean, it is the harmony that is the last word of the text and the first word in the title of the piece. And you'll notice that the, that the way that Paul structured, structured that text, which is absolute genius, and that piece works the, to the degree that it does because of what Paul did in that text, but you'll notice that the piece also ends on harmony about halfway through. Mm -hmm. And so the piece, the, the text itself is busy. The text is incredibly complicated because there's, there's actually at least two different diegetic voices, right? There's this voice of narrative talking about whatever it is, love or remembered love and recollection and all these sort of things that could actually be over, overtly nostalgic, which would be a dangerous as fuck thing to write a text about in the era of Donald Trump and Brexit and Viktor Orban and these sorts of people who have weaponized, to really pick up that word, 
uh, for tonight, these ideas of nostalgia, the again and, and fucking MAGA, right? Is this like absolutely weaponized uh, um, um, insistence with nothing behind it. This, this kind of this small dick energy of insisting that 30 years ago, 50 years ago, during racism was somehow better for the world, which is explicitly the political agenda of multiple different people who run countries in the world right now. Let us not dance, I mean, that is, it is essential to understand that that is something that people are prosecuting as a political project in the world right now, and that it is bad. It is bad for women, it is bad for people of color, it is bad for people who take themselves to be a majoritarian group in a country and are suppressed by their own leaders. Mm. So if you want to, as a Welsh poet who, of course, wants nothing to do with that, wants to blow up the stranglehold that conservative political minds, right, could have on, on the way that culture is supposed to proceed. What you want is you want something that suggests that the impulses of beauty or of recollected beauty that appear in nostalgia and that seem like a siren song to draw us towards these moments of nostalgia in our weaker moments, or our moments where we remember having once been in love or we hope to see love again in the future, that has to be passed through some sort of filter of thorns. It has to be put through something that acknowledges the difficulty and the complexity of, 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 of life and modernity, which can be traced back from maybe 1500 forward, but especially life from the 20th century forward, because we are all the descendants of this like insane violence and also brilliant intellectual tradition of the 20th century, right? We are nothing more than like the question mark of what is the 20th century become? So if you wanna look back, you have to also pass that through this type of complexity. And you'll notice that what Paul does in that text is he has a separate, separate voice that's not marked in any way that just relies on your subconscious to, to pick this out of these little direction words like back, forward, again, here I am on my own. It's like marked by adverbs and prepositions, like these kind of short words that are not semantic. They're not talking about a sparkling dress and marum grass and all of these like these kind of hyper poetic things. He's ad mixing a hyper poetic text that could be a simple story or memory or recollection or love and heteronormative love at that. He's intermixing it with these words that sound like small words that could have come from Samuel Beckett that confuse the direction of the storytelling that literally send us back. And so this is how you understand when harmony appears halfway through that text, it's the, the text trying to end itself before it's actually over. Mm -hmm. And I know because I've read almost everything that Paul Griffiths has written, like I know what he was up to when he was writing his libretto for Elliot Carter's opera, that what that is, that voice that says back, forward, on, and that ends, that tries to end the piece prematurely halfway through, is it's the same voice that's in the very old. Um, symphonia in the in the fourth movement and in the, in the third movement of the various symphonia which is Samuel Beckett and that is the voice of history what's being enacted there is our situation itself like will we end no we will go on have we made progress no we're back so we're ostensibly telling the story Paul is of, of love of two people but what's really going on is that he's trying to narrate history he's trying to narrate what it means to think history after Holocaust after, mm. genocide, after Mao after Stalin, after all of this sort of stuff. And the story that's being told there is, can we culture, can modernist culture that believes progress can be made, that believes that things can be difficult and interesting, can it go forward? No, back. Can we decide where we are? Are we in a forest or are we on a seashore? Mm. There's no reason, it's, it, would, it would be naive, incredibly naive to believe that that's actually what the text is asking us. Are we in a, remembering a forest or are we remembering a seashore? No, choose the text says, the choose is to us. How will we remember all of our Gestalt history? Will we be accountable for fucking slavery? Will mm. we be accountable for Holocaust? Will we be accountable for, for colonialism? Will we be accountable for the lies that we tell people who come to immigrate to society and we treat them like shit? Mm. Will we give a whitewashed view of this and make America great again? Mm. Choose. And so if you watch what I'm doing with the, you know, the ferocious instrumental music in that piece, I'm picking those moments to stop the text because I, I know what will happen is that the word, the language using part of the brain will remember this as the music picks up again. And it's usually there that I'm reinserting the music to animate those choices, those like historicist sort of choices that the text is suggesting without ever saying it to see if maybe I can cause you to think through those things and think through the way of the responsibility of thinking through those sorts of decisions. So the A major is, is giving the thing, giving the object of beauty, 
at the very end, and then of course negating it to suggest mm -hmm. the whole thing was in a dream bubble or a cloud or something that it's not reachable, which Paul's text then does because the text ends with the great not yet, right? Indicating that the perspective, you know, he, he shows his cards at the very end, which is that he was not ever going to give you the dream view of something beautiful. He was going to let you look at it and realize that no, we're not there yet. It is not done. Like you just sit there thinking, whatever it is that you're thinking, you're probably not thinking anything. Like it has a really powerful effect of subduing the language using part of the brain. Whatever's going on when you're listening to that, you're no longer using the, the language using part of the brain. You're just experiencing this big glowing red thing. And so then there's this, as I've learned to handle these larger and larger sort of durational objects and the pieces, I've learned that whatever you do first after leaving a super large duration retroactively causes people to understand what they just went through. And so I just added this one like modulation up by a half step to this kind of spectral sound in B flat to cause you to think, oh shit. You know, it's like staring at the center of the sun and then you realize that in fact you hadn't. Mm. And I think that that uses the resources of instrumental music to get it part of what the text and the, the motives behind the text as I read them is trying to do. Another way of putting this, if you, if you like spending time with philosophy books, is this kind of um, a musical understanding of Paul's poetry, which might be an understanding of like Jürgen Habermas's modernity is an unfinished project. I am not a postmodernist. I'm not a values relativist. I think all of that is bullshit. I think that the world is complex and interesting and we're supposed to work hard and that we basically never get it right even when we do, but that's no reason not fucking not to. And that was the whole purpose of like going through like French existentialism and Sartre, Jean-Paul Sartre made this point for even normal people to read in books that were bestsellers in the New York Times. And the point is that when the Nazis come knocking on your door, it, it sucks. And there are things that happen in the world where there is not, an, there is not a good option. They're just, the world is just full of these things where you can do everything right and you can have everything set right in your heart and you're still gonna get fucked by history, by other people, by internal evil. But all of that, none of that is a reason to then abandon the artistic or personal project to a, a mere postmodernism, a, a mere recycling of surfaces, a naive approach to a pop music that takes its audiences for granted or that talks down to people. Absolutely not. It's that you have to go forward knowing that it's not going to work. And the philosophical versions of that are something like, like Habermas. How about the relationship to ruins? The ruins? Yeah. That's interesting that you say that. What, what, brings that's, what brings that word to mind? This sort of tendency in contemporary music to focus on that evil as just sort of a romantic ruin, as a deconstruction of romantic values and say, all right, like we're negating that by looking at it as like a past object that's now been dismantled by time. Did, I give, you, did I give you that word? Did I did I tell you that story that when I was at Darmstadt at the first for the first time at your age in 1998, I was just there as just a just nobody like I, I snuck in. I didn't even like sign up for the courses and stuff. I just flew to Darmstadt and went there. And I went into a um, presentation panel where Haya and Brian were both there. I think Marco Stroppa was also there. And Haya was talking about her music and, and, and Fernio said um, of Haya's music, I feel like this is a, a ruins. And he meant like kind of a 19th century category for poetry. So think like Mary Shelley's uh, Frankenstein and Coleridge and these kind of English and German language poets in the um, 19th century who are writing about like the old castle, the old abandoned castle that's been weathered and, and all the poetry that comes out of that. And he said that he kind of heard that in Haya's music. And, and I thought even as a, you know, uh, 19, 20, 22, I don't remember how old I was person. I thought, yeah, that's right. That is a lot of what goes on in high school. Um, it is important to me that I am not writing in my own music only a ruins. It is important to me that just like the difficulty, the ex sometimes existential difficulty of the world that we live in shows up in the, mus in the music that I'm writing or trying to write, that also an acknowledgement that things are beautiful in this fucked up world that we live in also appear. And that's why there is usually an appeal to something beautiful in the music that I'm writing, frequently through over management of overtones. Mm. Um, there are other ways to do it. And there are lots of things that are beautiful in instrumental music. And the garden of, of, of things that are gorgeous that are coming out of the further push of the, the avant-garde of, of new music, it's actually expanding tremendously the number of things that we know that are beautiful in instrumental music. In the last 30 years, we've discovered all sorts of the appearance of whistle tones on the flute. It's not something that was ever used. Uh, the classical flutists knew about it and sometimes would, would write joke pieces for their students that involved it, but it was never an idea 
that could actually show up in the music was never scored. And now it seems like one of the most incredible ways of, of capturing a category of beauty that the other arts even have a hard time getting at, which is the, de the, the beauty that demands that you have to draw a close and hold your breath because you might miss it otherwise. And it just comes effortlessly and for free on, from the instruments of flutist who mastered, mastered the technique, right? And this, there are things like this showing up all the time. And so I have as an important part of my agenda the contextualizing of some of these materials of discovery in ways that reward us and, and acknowledge the fact that we perceive the world as beautiful. Because I do not agree with a flat new music perspective that thinks that we are only ever in a space of minor seconds and some are scary. Because it's not the world that I see. Any more than I see a dumb Americanist space who thinks that we're only in a consumer, consumer culture that things always have to sound good. All of these things are, are clearly not right. And so the resulting work of art is supposed to deliver on the idea that these things coexist and that the coexistence is incredibly tricky. Mm. And for the performers who do my music well, and there, there are a lot, a lot of them, I think that what they're keeping in mind is how to deliver both the beautiful parts and the terrifying parts as beauty and terror and not try to reduce it down to something, something else because I, I am always producing a mixed affect. And there are musicians who are able to champion that and be as big as that request to deliver on mixed affect. And then there are musicians who, who can't do that and who want to internalize a single affect, right? To blend it, blend it down. And that doesn't, that doesn't work well for what I uh, am ever trying to do. There might be a ruins in there, but there are always these moments that are contradicting that that's what I believe the world is because I do not believe that the world that we live in is a ruins. Yeah, good luck guys, just do something, you know, do produce something over the coming period, even if it means solos, even if it just means working on technique and documenting that in some way, even if it means collaborating with a composer to, to have a new solo written and you have a, a, the intimacy all comes over, over Skype sessions to get it right, but, but sure as fuck produce something. Do not go silently into this period just because infrastructure and restaurants and, and hospitals are having to behave in a totally different way. You are artists. And you're already exhibiting by the repertory that you're, you're showing that you have a commitment to difficulty. So remember that that's there in this period that could otherwise be perceived as silent for the next 12 months or even the next 24 months. Make sure that something spectacular is produced in this period. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode of Everything But The Kitchen Sink. We hope you enjoyed it. If you'd like to hear more, you can find all the episodes of our summer series on our YouTube channel and our website, alnayensemble.org. Also, be sure to check out our social media profiles for more information and previews of upcoming episodes. Our handle is Alanea Ensemble. Please feel free to share today's episode with anybody you think might like it, and don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions or comments. Stay tuned for more episodes of Everything But The Kitchen Sink, released every Friday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And as always, we hope you are all safe and well. See you next time.